So, racing legend Derek Walker, if you could summarize this lunch we just had, what would it be? Well, apart from indigestion, it's <laughs> been a total waste of two hours of chatting <laughs> about nothing. <laughs> And now for Dinner with Racers, presented by Continental Tire. With your hosts, Ryan Eversley and Sean Heckman. Placeholder Radio. I was driving very angry to the sound of a driver on the radio during a race. What do you think I should go to? All right, welcome to Dinner with Racers. I'm Ryan Eversley, alongside my co-host, Sean Heckman. That's me. And we're on our giant cross-country tour coming to an end and Highway 75 here in Georgia. We've been on the road about 30 days, and we've gone about 8,000 miles across 20 states to bring you 27 dinners for you to then criticize us about. Now, I have to say, sitting in the passenger seat for the majority of this, the comfortability I have had in this Acura MDX has been unreal. I've been able to work. I've been able to sit here with my computer plugged in. Yeah. It was like being at the office. You've literally had everything you've needed to do all your jobs. Yeah. yeah. All could fit in this Acura MDX. And of course, one thing that helps that is the smoothness of the Continental tires. Continental gave us a brand new set of tires to go do this uh, cross-country tour on, and they've been awesome. Uh, so let's uh, move on to the most professional kind of dinner conversation that, that we've had the whole time. And by professional, I mean on one side of the table, not the other. Uh, and that is with none other than Derek Walker. Uh, now, if you don't know the story of Derek Walker, he's this is sort of one of those legends of motorsports that we were super fortunate to have. And in I got to say, Derek had absolutely no idea why we were there or why he agreed to do it. Right. About an hour before time for us to show up, he, he emailed back saying, don't worry about the audio equipment. Yeah. And that, that's something we need to do this. <laughs> so it was pretty funny kind of getting his uh, his reaction when we showed up. And he honestly didn't know anything about us. And that kind of made it more fun. Exactly. We, we show up in his office like, wait, so what are you doing again? It's like, well, it's a podcast. And we kind of had to explain what podcasts were. But to his credit, he went with it. Yeah. Sat down for, for a little while and, and kind of gave us all the time we asked for and answered all of our questions. And But anyway, so here's the background of Derek Walker. Um very, very storied career. He actually began uh, his motorsport career with a, an old Formula One team known as Brabham. Most recently, uh, Derek had a very large role within competition at IndyCar, right. um, kind of crossing over to what he called the dark side, where he was very involved in the technical regulations and, and, and having all the teams deal with each other. Um, that all comes concurrently with him running his own race team known as Walker Racing, uh, which is sort of just wrapping up their sports car program in the uh, uh, IMSA WeatherTech Championship. They'd had a great partnership with Falcon Tire. Yeah. Uh, for several years uh, and before that he ran his own IndyCar team for years and years and years had a bunch of legends driving for him all of that summarized in the fact that he is not a guy that's afraid to tell you where you stand uh, he was not afraid to call us idiots yeah he called us Muppets like six times we actually brought food to his office we went just a couple blocks away to uh, the BBI deli yeah. in Indianapolis Indiana uh, Derek not knowing what the hell we were doing didn't really give us anything to go off of when we ordered sandwiches so our mean at BBI gave us a variety of sandwiches none of which Derek liked and uh, we went from there so here is a fantastic lunch with the great Derek Walker courtesy of Continental Tire Meow. All right, we're going to start in five, four, three, two. Yeah, we are good to go. We're just admiring the artwork. Yeah, well, I had, had a home that wasn't very far from here. It was quite a large house that, when I came to this area, had built and had everything that was... I collected along the way in racing, I'd sort of stored there, and then when I downsized, I had nowhere to put it, so all right. the shit sit back here. <laughs> so that's why it looks like a motor racing menagerie. Right, right, right. But it's a, it's a good variety. I mean, you got everything well, from Willie T. Ribs to Silver Well, Ferry. they're probably somehow connected as to where I've been. Sure, right. Which is a bad thing, because then it shows you how... Do you want to uh, have a quick look downstairs? Sure. Yeah, let's take a look. Might give you a little bit of an idea of what we've got here. Okay, we go on the 
so distinguished only in so much as that uh, we didn't win. Right. Well, not for myself, I didn't. I won for, for other people. That doesn't count. Because you had, what's he so it was Fittipaldi in 94? Yeah. 95? And Goodyear. And then, then Goodyear. Good year. That one had to be brutal. Yeah, well. It have been that close. Well, actually, the the Fittipaldi one was uh, worse in a way because we had Robbie Gordon in the closing stages of the race was leading the race. Right. He And there was yellow, and he thought he had had it. He had a puncture. Oh, that's right. And in those days, you didn't have tire pressure sensors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you had to listen. And, and so we just, we, I mean, I basically just told him on the radio, it's your call. You know, how yeah. would I know if it's got a puncture or not? It's right. your call. So he opted to come in the pits and change tires and uh, got back out and finished seventh. But he didn't have a puncture. Right. And Christian was lying third at that time. Right. So and he then, ended up second. There was a whole black flag and all that. So then it was game over. Nice. So which one of these would you say is the greatest memory for you? Or which one takes you back? Let me have you put this on too if you can. Can you hear us okay? What? Can you hear me okay? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I can. They, yeah, it's going to be a painful time. Yeah. So which which one of these pictures takes you back the most? Uh, well, every picture, as they say, tells a story. Sure. So each one of them, uh, I can I can still remember right. what was going on then. I've still got my faculties that I can remember. But, uh, I, you know, they were... In part, a snapshot of uh, 46 or 7 years in racing. Right. So, nice. they've all got a place, but, you know, I, some of them, I wasn't going out to collect pictures of racing. <laughs> it's just some right. of them, some of them you got, or some of them were given, or some of them you thought, oh, that's a neat picture, I'll keep it. Right, absolutely. So, this Penske photo that we're looking at, are you in there? Uh, I'm not in there, but I was there. Right. Um, I was on the other car. Okay. Uh, that was um, at Phoenix, and uh, it was the first race for the PC6, as it was called. Right. So that was the first Indy car. Well, I correct. Uh, it was the second Indy car that Penske ever made of his own. The first one, I'm ashamed to say, was a... Uh, McLaren copy. Yeah. <laughs> I can say that now. And uh, this was the first actual thoroughbred Penske that was right. uh, raced in Phoenix that year. Wow. Is that Roger on the signboard? Yeah, he's on the signboard. Nice. And uh, there's a quite an array of people there that are sort of been around and right. still around in one form or other. How would you say he is from then to now? Because this is what year is this? This is <coughs> eighty eighty one. No, no, that um, that would have been seventy nine. Okay. You end of seven. Know. End of seventy seven. Something okay. like that. I don't think you want to know how old uh, Ryan and I were then. <laughs> so. Yeah, just little puppies. I <laughs> yeah, think. if even. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how has Roger changed? Um, in some respects, not much. He's still, um, you know, he, he's still clear on right. what he wants and demands. Um, I mean, he's a racer. That's yeah. that's it. Uh, but he's a businessman as yeah. well. So um, hasn't changed a lot. Obviously, age like all people, and sure. uh, you know, he just keeps on ticking. You know, he just has a. Is he every bit as sharp as he was then? Would you say? Well, I don't know who is, right? When you get, <laughs> I can't argue with anybody, sir. So I got nothing. But. No, I mean, as you get years, I think you lose some, you gain some. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, I think he's still, he's still got it. Right. Yeah, for sure. How did the dynamic change for you two between sort of working for him on the on the team side versus the last couple of years where you're more on the the tech side? Um, 
Well, if you'd asked me prior to actually leaving IndyCar, yeah. I would have said it was was good. Yeah. Uh, but um, Roger um, uh, and Tim Sendrick, probably more specifically, sure. uh, uh, didn't, I think it's fair to say, from what a feedback I've had, didn't agree with what I was doing at IndyCar. Right. So, um, but you know, Roger doesn't, he doesn't bear grudges. It's all about winning and it's right. all about the job. So you don't take uh, that position carefully. But up until then, I mean, I've, uh, I've enjoyed working with him and I have the greatest respect for him. Sure. So when it came to like the lobbying and the posturing and all that stuff, that was pretty much a Tim deal. No, Roger would get into it. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's, but you know, that's, that. It's the same for every team. That's sure. not. That's not exclusive. You know, to how you, you, works. you got your job to do, and everybody's yeah. got you know their perspective. But right. it's not something you um, you know divides relationships. It's, right. um, it's not personal, and it's all about getting the job done. And I would have to say, as being on the other side of the fence, on the white side, I would say, <laughs> as opposed to the dark side. Right. <laughs> um, on the <laughs> is on that how it is at the office, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys declare that when you walk in? And, Hello, fellow white side. No, no, no. What I meant was on the dark side was my reference to being an official. Right, 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 right. right? <coughs> so we assume if it's dark over there when you're a team owner, you've got this right. brilliance of clairvoyant and, uh, you and know, no one reality. Knows what they're doing on the other side, right? <laughs> you got more reality than those guys who are in their <laughs> sure. uh, officials. So. Right. So on the dark side, uh, you have a very uh, w different view than you do on the pit lane side. Sure. And, um, you know, that's that's where the great divide, you know, the teams uh, don't always see it from the overall right. point of view. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And, and so when, when you came in, that was sort of supposed to be why you were there, right? Was it you, you obviously, I mean, we're here at your shop. You you ran teams for years. You still do. Yeah. Um, so you get the economies, you get how it all has to be scaled, you get how it really works. Um, so it's a lot harder to claim that, well, this guy doesn't know what he's doing because you're, you're in there doing it. Yeah, well, I, I would like to think I did know what I was doing. Yeah. And, and uh, till somebody proves me wrong, I'll believe that. Right. Um, but no, y yes, but but the the problem is is when you come from what you think the series ought to do, and when you get on the series side and you see how many different angles you've got to look at it from yeah. different points of view, you've got economics, you've got fans, you've got a, a lot of other parts that influence your decision making. Right. That what appears from a team point of view is you just got to do this and this and this right. and that's the way it'll need to sure. be yeah. and it'll be perfect. And it's fixed. It's it's never that simple. Right. But, you know, uh, I, d I don't think you could have fully that perspective until you actually work on the dark side. <laughs> have and you ever... Th that's ahead. my defense. Until <laughs> 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 somebody <laughs> proves me wrong. Have you ever been in an IndyCar fan forum? Like on any of the web, you know, any of the websites, racer. dot com or anything like that. Where yeah, you see. yeah, I've been bits and pieces, yes. or uh, I'd get my Muppet mate, Mister Robin Miller, would <laughs> se send <laughs> send me questions. Please tell me that's how you address him in person. I do, I do. Yeah. <laughs> he's actually he's actually a good friend of mine. Sure. Believe it or not, I believe it. Uh, we agree to disagree on just about everything, but. Um, <laughs> No, I get a lot of fan letters, and I would yeah. he would send them to me, and I would answer. Right. So that I don't have huge exposure to fans, but sure. I I don't know if I really need to in a sense. No, you don't. Because well, not necessarily because of that. It sounds bad when you say it that way, but <laughs> but I, I I'm I'm still very much of a fan as I was 40-odd years ago before I got into racing. Right. Well, it's certainly so not I, the money. I haven't, uh, <laughs> I haven't uh, lost touch with um, what a fan Sure, I like to think. Well, the, the, the reason I ask is, you know, right, this has been kind of a recurring theme for Ryan and I We've on our, on our road trip to around the country here is, is you know, there, there are some very active fans, you know, on the forum. So you read an article on Racer or IndyCar, mm. and, and all of a sudden there's 35 opinions underneath it that are all solving the world's problems. You know, and and I don't know that it's always obvious how complex the issues really are. And IndyCar in particular has some very, very dedicated fans. And yeah. And one of the things I would love to sort of get from you is is we all know it's complex, but just sort of how complex is it? Because you've got everything from, 
you know, the the Holman George family, who I assume has sort of their way of running the series or the way they want it. You've got what you think the series needs. You have teams who are are very hampered by budgets in a time where it's even harder than it's ever been to get mm -hmm. sponsorship. What are sort of the the list of challenges if you put it out there? Well, um, we've got a, I think, a really great product. There's a lot of parts of IndyCar that are not broken. But I think we in the business and somewhat the fans as well, uh, we almost can't be proud of that. We almost yeah. have to break it up. We have right. to criticize it. We have to throw it in the trash verbally that it's not this and it's not that. Right. And I think the challenges are really all about how do we energize the fan base to really enjoy our product more than they do and more people who aren't energized, the young, the lost generation, as I like to call it, the youngsters that are not looking at racing necessarily right. anywhere. But how do we energize them to come to our business and want to be here, want to play, want to be entertained? Because to, to get them over brings the sponsorship, brings the relief, brings success, because it's really all about the eyeballs. Yeah. And so what energizes the eyeballs I like to think hasn't changed in 40 odd years sure. and it's the stars and the cars. The cars have to be wow, they have to be sexy, yeah. they have to be fun, they have to be dynamic and, yeah. <coughs> and and we got bits and pieces of that but not where it needs to be sure. otherwise maybe we'd be further ahead. And the stars, you know, the, there's such a difficult road. We don't build stars or we w let them wander around until they eventually go somewhere else or give right. up right. and we need to build fans so but having said those simple principles it requires money it requires time and uh indycar no matter how good or how rich we think it is it's not got unlimited resources to do it right and so it's like a vicious circle the fans if they hear about it and they you bombard them with advertisement and excitement, uh, they'll come and watch it maybe, and maybe they'll come back again and again and again. But you've got to have money to advertise and reach yeah. out to those guys. Until you get sponsors, you yeah. don't have real and money. So it's, so it's sort of like a vicious circle. But yeah. you know, I think the one thing I have learned, and people may be surprised to hear this, because they probably thought I couldn't learn anymore, but I did. <laughs> And that is, as I've come out of IndyCar, looking back at IndyCar, to me it seems very clear that we don't appreciate what we have there. Yeah. It is actually, yeah. from the organization to the product, in spite of itself, yeah. it is actually damn good. I can look at a lot of other series yeah. that I think would be dying to have what they've got. The infrastructure, right. the people, I mean, it's not perfect. But I'll right. tell you what, um, it's not as bad as we make it sound sure. in the business, which is sad. Yeah. Where do you think, what series do you think is getting it right right now? Sorry? What series do you think is getting it right right now? Well, the, I don't think any series is getting it right um, singularly. They've, sure. got, they've got bits that are really good and and other parts that are lagging behind. Um, you know, there's the phenomena, if you like, of... Um, looking at global rally and right. you look at some of the numbers and that and the millenniums or the right. whatever they call themselves nowadays it used to be just young people before now they've got a title <laughs> so i guess i've got to call them by that that's true <laughs> so, uh, it's obvious if there's any any youngsters out there they're going to stone me on my way home <laughs> Um, they don't stone anymore either. No, okay. <laughs> the, the technology has Arrows, changed. Maybe? Yeah, now it's up to spears. Uh, yeah, spears, yeah, okay. Spears. Ooh, yeah. that was painful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I think if you look at Global Rally, and they've got they've got some things that are really interesting that yeah. should make us look at it. But you know, that's I don't know if you look at a Global Rally and you say, ah, that's good. That's what we need. Right. Let's have all these guys crashing into each other right. and tearing body work off. Ah, we, need, we need jumps and, and, in IndyCar. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we yeah, need I mean, jumps yeah. at Indy. I'm, I think IndyCar's got to find its own wild sure, factor. Sure. And it yeah. can learn from some of the lessons of other series, but it's still got to figure out its direction. And right. that's where leadership is key. I yeah. mean, we need, we need strong leadership, a visionary right. leadership that 
is about today and what will energize the bunnies today. Right. One of the, one of the key arguments you always hear on fan forums or Robin Miller shaking his saber is uh, is part of that wow factor would be returning back to speed and really kind of going for mm. track records and all that. And I've always assumed beyond the safety side of it that one of the big issues is the second you sort of get away from this sort of closer to spec category that we have now that you're going to create an arms race that teams simply can't afford. Um, but I don't know if that's necessarily true. It's just always been an assumption on my part. Uh, uh, it doesn't just have to be speed. It can be just technology, right? Yeah. can cause that arms race. Yeah. Oh, no, I think you definitely have to be very co cognizant of that. But I think what is more important is, you know, we do need that. How do we manage that? How yeah. do we... How do we do that in such a way that doesn't bankrupt this, you know, just let the runaway train go and put us out of business? Right. And that comes to plans, so that comes to leadership. And, you know, we're capable of solving these problems. It's just that we've got to look at it and say, well, let's not, let's not go totally spec because we think technology is bad and speed's bad. Right. Let's say we need some of that. How do we get it? How do we make right. it happen? And what can, how can we make that financially work? And that's not something that's easily to resolve. It takes yeah. years to evolve that. Right. But, you know, I think it's, it's doable. Within sort of the infighting, so to speak, where are most of the arguments coming from in the sense of like, you know, so-and-so is arguing, no, 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 we can't afford to do this. So-and-so is arguing, no, 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 we need to be going 240. Is there, is there a lot of infighting on that sense, or is it just that no one really knows exactly what the right call is? Because I assume everyone's got an opinion. Uh, well, yeah, and opinions are healthy. I mean, everybody should have an opinion, right, uh, you, that everybody does. Um, no, I, I think it really comes down to the, uh, the sport has to, uh, the governing body, has to be the keeper of the keys. It has to be looking at all aspects and deciding how do you how do you get towards the future. I uh, consider myself very fortunate in the sense that when I was in Formula One, believe it or not, mm -hmm. um, uh, I worked for Brabham, and one day a little guy bought it over, and that was Bernie Eccleston. Right. Uh, Formula One back then was similar in so much as the team owners had a lot of influence and they were more interested in going racing, getting money and going racing. That was their primary thing. That was not a group of owners that had a vision for how Formula yeah. One should be. It wasn't that. Um, and it was migrating through the kit car formula in the sense you bought your standard Hewland gearbox and yep. your standard V8 Cosworth and you yeah. go racing. And you have a Formula sure. One team and, right. and you're worried about how you beat everybody. Uh, but the one guy that came on board was Bernie Eccleston. And here's a guy who was around racing but not really a neophyte racer in yep. terms of the nuts and bolts and the cylinder sizes. Right. That was not his business. But he was a car salesman, but he had a clarity and a vision, which he saw Formula One in a specific way. And, and I will stay uh, convinced of this, that Formula One would not be what it is today had he not come along and taken Absolutely. the reins. Yeah. And so there are people out there that can have that clarity and take it. And I would have to say... Okay, the world has changed a little bit since the 70s when Bernie came along, or, uh, yeah, the 70s, yeah, early 70s. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the world has changed, but I would have to say I think IndyCar's in a better position than Formula One yeah. was back then. Absolutely. So there is, a, there is a ripe formula that could energize our bunny. Now, Formula One has its challenges, but right. you'd have to say it's... Uh, you know, it's never given up trying. It's always yeah. looking to push the envelope, and it's always about the ultimate, right? Right. You can't just have a pit stop be 15 seconds. You've got to have one that's two, yeah. half, two and a half seconds or something. And, right. You know, and bring back that spectacle. So yeah, so yeah. They, they find a way. And I'm not saying they do everything right, but I think, um, to me, that shows that you can take what was a mediocre formula and almost dying on the vine in some respects yeah. back then and uh, one guy made a difference right uh, how, how close did you guys work together between you and bernie well i I, I don't say i worked together with bernie now i'm still friends with him and i okay. always go and make a point to go and see him and, right. and talk to him but you know I don't talk on a daily basis sure, sure so you are a team owner now and obviously when you worked with bernie he was a team owner is there any similarities between the two of you anything you might have picked up 
You're taller, from him. I think. Yeah, you definitely got him on the height. I had him on height, <coughs> but he, he had me on brains, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I could build the car and set it up and run it. He probably couldn't, but anything else, he had me down pat. No, he he, he was interested in the uh, race team, but as he saw, this is my version, he may have a different version, but as well, he's we, our next interview. Uh, yeah, not, you should. He he be <laughs> he right, never take he'd our be call. worth uh, the price of admission. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think I, my perception was when he looked around and saw that no matter how successful he was going to be or tried to be, uh, it was only as good as the environment of the business was, and so he started doing things to make the business climate better for team owners and then it consumed him to the point is that he could spend his whole waking day just worrying about how to build the series and get the events and get the manufacturers engaged so you know he he quickly sort of migrated away from his team and uh, ended up 100 percent on the series right. so but i think that sort of um I don't know. I mean, that ability to look at it and say, my race team and my world's only going to be as good as the series is and the world that the series operates in, and giving uh, to help make it happen is uh, giving support to allow it to happen. And I think is crucial crucial for any owner group of hockey team sure or anything. Yeah. yeah, it's all the same. Do you want more of your sandwich, by the way? Feel free. Huh? Do you want more of your sandwich, by the way? Feel free. Uh, no, it wasn't very good. It's <laughs> <laughs> we I went. I can see why you left this one for we me. We had it. No, we had absolutely no clue what to get. What was the place called? BB. BB's BBI. BB like BBI Deli yeah, or something yeah, like yeah, that. Pretty good. No, I'll yeah. eat it later. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was actually like a question. We're like, oh, what yeah. do we? No idea. Let's just get something from yeah. 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 So we bought three sandwiches because we had literally no. That's clue. all right. I don't actually uh, have much lunch. Yeah, you said you don't really eat lunch. Not much. No, I mean uh, I con some friends and employees. I coerce them to go down the road to an Indian restaurant occasionally nice. for lunch, and we have this buffet Indian. That's about the limit. Otherwise, I try to just lay low here and uh, get slim. Only yeah. it hasn't worked yet. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> the ring on your uh, right hand with the checkered flag, what is that from? That is um, the Indy 500. It's 1985. Um, winner's ring. Nice. Um, that was when you were with Penske? Uh, yeah, yeah. That was the Danny Sullivan year. Yeah. Uh, the spin and win. That's when I work, was working there, yeah. What were you doing at that time, running the car team. Right. Oh, so you were the car my, my, chief, crew chief. Well, I I ran a car, uh, which uh, was Danny's in this case, but I was the general manager. I was okay. your Tim Sindrick sure, of sure. back then. Right, right. Did you and when when you got into sort of the series management side, did you and Bernie ever speak? Uh, once I did, yeah. yeah. I mean, I uh, I would go to the Coda and right because there's got to be something. There's got to be some sort of sage advice he gave. Um, no, he, he didn't. I mean, Bernie, actually, I saw in writing the other day, uh, gave his opinion what he thinks of America. Yeah, I read and, the same uh, And I've heard that from Bernie himself. But I think um, one of the key parts of what Bernie says when he lavishes praise for uh, Putin... <laughs> <laughs> as he did in this yeah, case yeah. right um was he, he he's joking but he's really serious i yeah. mean putin is uh, probably singularly minded as bernie is and yeah. uh, ruthless uh, in, yeah. in whatever way he needs to get things done not I'm not saying i approve of everything putin but but i think the 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 takeaway which i've heard bernie say this and i absolutely am convinced it's uh the missing link is that uh, it's leadership. It's yeah. the leadership. And, uh, um, you know, finding people that um, know how to lead, I think, is uh, yeah. is the missing link in a lot of different walks of life. Right, right. There's only a few of those Putins or whoever are the you don't have your support. Right. You don't have to say anything you don't want to, but is there a fix for that? Is there? Is there... A leader that can come through right now, particularly in IndyCar, that 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 you can see in front of you right now and be like, okay, this guy's a good fit. 
Well, uh, I mean, we have Mark Miles, who yeah. is running the series now. Um, I think it's all, there's a caveat to that that ought to be said, and that is that, um, you know, not everybody could build um, a franchise like Bernie Eccleston, if we use yeah. him as the model, um, a not-so-benevolent dictator, you know, yeah. who was tough when he needed to be tough, but uh, brought in the brought in the money, right. and, and everybody profited. A lot of people have been, been made very rich, and the series has grown into, you know, beyond expectations yeah. over its from where it was right. uh, whether it needs to be something else that's another story but there's more than i like to say there's more than one way to skin a cat and yeah. and it's not necessary that everybody should do it bernie's way i haven't actually seen another way but i'd give it the benefit of the doubt and mark has only just been in the job a couple of years or more and i would say from past experience it takes a while to figure it out yeah, uh, for sure. and so he's still going through that learning his way yeah. we'll see if his way works i wouldn't say it doesn't but um i think um his management style is different to say the bernies sure but i would also put in the in the same category the rogers yeah roger is very similar to Bernie in many respects. He has a is a better way to package it, and he's not quite as uh, you know as uh, direct as Bernie can be. But Roger's very singularly minded, and they they both have some some things very uh, similar in common, and that is they don't need a lot of words to say what they want to happen they, they don't unlike me rabbit on here he he could have said it in about three or four words yeah and doesn't make for a good podcast <laughs> no it doesn't work i should have been a politician and um, <laughs> and the other thing they're very similar in is they have small organizations they don't have a lot of people they don't have matrix management yeah they have management they listen to the people but they employ the right people and they energize their bunnies and they they manage the ship, you know, yeah. the direction of the ship. So they're very similar in that way. It's amazingly small organizations of key people, and um, and they get things done. People at work from don't have to be you know, lectured on how you should come to work and do it. They come energized. They pick good people. Yeah. That's the other thing. They're very similar. They know how to pick their people, and um, that's the kind of thing I think you know, leadership. Right. So we're out. Does. You two are... Oh, I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's not Definitely happening. non-starters. <laughs> I, I could tell that when... I could tell that when you our sandwich told list. me what my lunch was. <laughs> but uh, it's okay. It's probably got a budget. Have you got a budget? Oh, we have a budget. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that's yeah. where it is. We're probably way over it. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're <laughs> <laughs> so you've gotten to work with some pretty impressive drivers over your, over your history. Um I assume I know the answer to this, but who's the biggest pain in the ass? Oh, God. Shinji Nakano. Who is the biggest pain in the ass? Shinji Nakano. It's got to be. It's got to be. No, no, no. Shinji was all That's who I have picked out. It's not Shinji. <laughs> no, Shinji was okay. I mean, I, I, pain in the ass, that's probably being a bit unfair to them. Um, these guys, if you think about it, being a driver, you can relate to this perhaps. It's... Um, you know you're you're so dependent on your results you're so dependent on the next sponsor or the next team is going to think you are you know you put so much pressure on yourself or the business put so much pressure on yourself that i don't know why you wouldn't be a pain in the ass when things don't go right or right. when you need things exactly the way you need them to do the best job you can so i i don't think i had too many drivers that were they all had their ways but then i'm sure they would all talk about me and say well gee he was a wanker or whatever <laughs> senator Derek walker over yeah here. absolutely i, I didn't that see was it. not an answer yeah i, li I like it that is, you, it is. you literally spent two minutes not answering i give you credit <laughs> oh, that is amazing no no, no, no no i give you credit i think that's awesome <laughs> god he caught me <laughs> no no but if you want to name names i'll tell you what their pain in the ass was but if you say did i did i have one any more than the other nah actually i'll tell you the the biggest pain in the ass you get in the business is not the drivers, it's usually their dads. 
Oh, we yeah, should, yeah. yeah. This is it. Sports car is obviously a huge yeah, theme I mean, of that. The dads yeah. are worse than the drivers. Yeah, actually. absolutely. Yeah, so, so they, they, my guess was Robbie Gordon. No, actually, Robbie, yeah, Robbie. And I'm a huge Robbie Gordon fan, but I just assumed, the, I've listened to his radio, especially in the yeah. later parts of his career and the uh, mm. NASCAR stuff and then the, the Dakar trucks and things mm. like that. And he's just so full tilt that I imagine he just, if something's not right, he lets you know about it really quickly. Yeah, but, you know, um, but the thing with, with Robbie is, um, it, and this goes for any driver, if you're a team owner, you see the talent and it becomes the challenge to manage that talent so that you get the best performance sure. as often as you can and sometimes you can't get it and sometimes the dark side comes out and you got a tantrum or two or right. a, you tell them no and they do it but you know I think if you have respect for the talent they've got you you you, you know you go f nuts you get frustrated with them but I don't see that that it was ever a point where I said, we've got to get rid of this guy. Sure. Yeah. Now, some dads I said that yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. <laughs> we, we, we were just having this conversation because, obviously, Ryan and I kind of specialize in sports car racing, and, and Ryan, you know, before he was driving for, for Honda, um, you know, in, in many cases, a lot of times, Ryan's co-driver would be sort of his employment. Yeah. And as Ryan and I have discussed several times, a lot of times it's not necessarily the kid that he that has to like him, it's his dad. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so you know oh, very yeah. well. That's uh Dads are into it, big time. But, you know, on the other hand, some of these kids wouldn't have got where they got if dad wasn't into it, right. you know. So you, you get the, to go back, yeah. you know. But the, the dad will only see it from his kid's point of view. And, and no matter how, how you try to, and especially if the, co the other driver in the team uh, is doing better, then yeah. there's almost nothing you can say or, you yeah. know, show that would prove that, your kids may be just off half a second. And they're going to argue all the good stuff is going into his and, car. And, and all so that. from that <laughs> yeah. point, it's, yeah. uh, but you know, I, it, it's, it is what it is. So was there ever a dad that you, that you really got into it with? Oh, I'd had a few arguments with, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Senator Derek Walker once again. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shinji no. Nakano's dad. Shinji Nakano's dad, clearly. <laughs> that was it. Why are we just, on Shinji? He's uh, a good guy. No, I don't know. It's just, <laughs> just because I wouldn't assume that to yeah, be the case. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, man, screaming no, at you in Japanese. Yeah. Uh, actually, I've got a, um, I've got a, not a trophy. There's a little uh, car in that box. Yep. And if I bring it over, you could see. I, I could take a guess. Yeah, is well, it, is that an Australian vineyards? The dad, it's an Atlantic. Ah, yeah, okay. the dad um, sent me a message, which I'll show you, uh, which basically called me a scumbag, oh. uh, and oh, and then good. later on, you know, sent a year or so later, nothing but admirations for me, and I hadn't done <laughs> anything. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, no, there, there's just a. I mean, at the end of the day, if dads become uh, too much of a hassle, they end up leaving anyway. Yeah. And you look at it and say, well, you know, missed the boat on that one. It failed to there. Whether it was his fault or your fault, you, you didn't get a benefit out of it. It didn't yeah. stay long enough or you didn't have any success. Right. So it's never it's never just get rid of dad. It's, it's the program didn't get what everybody had hoped to get out of it right. for whatever reason. In a, in a team like yours, where there is, does have to be a customer basis to to sort of fund this the shop that we're in, sure. um, you know, uh, you're just coming off of a, a several year stint in in the IMSA series, running for Falcon Tire. Um, I assume there's a balance because with a racing dad, you're you're dealing directly with the guy, and even if he disagrees with you, he gets the sport. Um, in something like Falcon's case, I, I assume, and I don't actually know, that you're dealing with you know, more of a, a corporate structure and maybe you're dealing with marketing people or business execs who are not necessarily racers per se. Um, yeah, is there it, a it there? is different. Yeah. Uh, the emotion is not there, which with a dad it is. Yeah. And it sort of blinds them from the realities you're telling them. Um, working with a company, um, particularly like Falcon, um, you know, the, those experiences can be quite... Um, uh, difficult as well yeah. because on one hand the tires uh, uh, are better or worse depending on the day that you're on 
And uh, depending on how you look at it, you say, well, if the car was better, the tires wouldn't be so bad. You know, it would have right. had some success because right. it was a car setup or something. Right. And then when the car setup you think is fine and the tires burn up, then everybody say, well, the tires obviously junk, you know, whatever. Uh, the good thing about the Falcon um, was, and there's two two um, areas of Falcon. There's Falcon USA, which is the American marketing side of Falcon. And then the company in Japan, this SRI, that makes uh, Sumitomo rubber, makes uh, the tires there. So you're dealing with two different uh, companies, basically. But I can honestly say in the five years we worked together, um, we always worked together. Uh, right. It was, uh, there wasn't... Uh, finger pointing i think the realistic part was is this is this is uh going up the best you know best in the business whether yeah. teams or tires Multiple or engines cars and the whole thing. Yeah, yeah so yeah. we're one little team and we've yeah. got a tire that can or could or did you right. know how was a sports car for you because i mean you're primarily known as an open wheel guy yeah um, was that your first venture in sports car uh well actually i started in uh GT racing many moons ago before I got into formula racing. Nice. Where'd you, where at? Well, I worked for a private guy who won a lottery <laughs> and decided he'd... Wow, uh, things don't change. <laughs> he, he would go racing. So he had a little racing company. It was nobody, anybody sure, great. Sure. But they had bought a um, uh, an Austin Healey Sprite, as it was back then. With a, It was a specially made Sprite. It was an aluminum body they put on it to go to Le Mans with it. And so that was my first start. So I, I ticked around in that for a while and then gradually worked into other things. But no, uh, the IMSA series, the GT racing, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I thought it was great. So actually, I I don't see the difference between a GT and, and an IndyCar. Yeah, they've yeah, got right. different kinds of tracks, but the, the principle's the same. The, you know, what, the dynamic is the same and yeah. the team, how they think and how they work. We, we had several IndyCar people involved in this program. How is the business side different? I mean, a perfect example is it's very common in sports car because we have so few races relative to an IndyCar schedule. You'll have a lot of fly-in guys, not as many full-time yeah. guys. Is, is IndyCar a little different? Because obviously a lot of your guys are full-time and salaried, I assume. Yeah, that was. And that, yeah. that was um, an eye-opener for me. I didn't really think about it like that when I got the deal. Yeah. I had basically pitched Falcon two years before I actually did anything with them. Right. Cause I saw I was looking for work and I saw them going around with this GT40. It looked terrible. Oh, right, <laughs> forgot about that. The, the yeah. tires yeah. were really struggling, and yeah. I said, I think you know, why don't we get a more competitive car? And so I made them a proposal, and then they said, Oh, thanks very much, but no thanks. We've got a local guy. We're going to go with him. We're going to buy a Porsche. And, okay, right. fair enough. So I forgot all about them until one day the phone rang and Falcon said, Can we come and see you? So uh, they flew here the next day and. Uh, sat here in front of me and said, you know, we want you to, we want to bring that program to you and can you run it for us? And so it was a one-year deal. And yeah. I said, yeah, sure. And then about a week later, a truck turned up with this big pile of shit, really. It was <laughs> just a monster. I mean, stuff. It, yeah. I mean obviously, obviously yeah. the relationship had fallen apart between team and... Yeah, sure. yeah, so yeah. they packed everything they had. They didn't and want said, the same tip or whatever. I don't know, but it was pretty, pretty challenging. So right. we opened up the truck and went, oh, yeah. But no... Um, <laughs> But then I realized the contractor and, you know, to learn what GT needed, we need skilled people and yeah. they don't all live in Indianapolis, you know, yeah. it's almost, so you have to look at fly-ins. But over the five years, I changed it so that I had at least uh, probably up to a 40, to f no, 50 to 60% was based here in Indianapolis okay. sure. full-time. Okay. Wow, that's... So it's not as common. Really. You'd mentioned that it took about a couple of years of nurturing that for it to finally come into something. And mm -hmm. I assume for these kind of budgets, that's probably a realistic timeline of how things kind of cultivate. So, you know, here we are in October kind of figuring out what, you know, what's next for Walker Racing. And I assume that's one of the big fears right now is that, you know, we're not necessarily sure what your future holds and it takes time for any of these sort of things to gestate. Yeah, very much so. I mean, um, 
Um, my mistake, if there is one, and there always is, yeah. when it comes to me. No, not over here. We've got to blame somebody, mistakes. and I think I'll have to take the blame. No, no when, you can, when you I was. Blame Sean. Yeah. yeah, I take a lot of blame. Yeah, well, I blame, I'm blaming him for the sandwich. <laughs> I'm not sure I can blame him for anything else. That was Sean's fault, too. That was my fault. Actually, well, it was Armin at uh, BBI. <laughs> I was like, all right, we got a dude. He's, uh, uh, he's from the UK. I need your three most generic sandwiches you got. I don't know what he wants. <laughs> and this is what you got. See, That's all right. Like a PR guy. See how I shifted the blame? You didn't put it to me, though. No, I didn't put it to you. I put it. I, I okay, blame yeah, somebody that can't defend himself. <laughs> That's If you're a good PR guy, you have to blame the guy. That's well, I'll, I'll tell you, you two, you have some advice, if I may. Absolutely. May do give you some, because I'm First a little older. Shave. Is uh, don't give up your day job. <laughs> <laughs> Stay out of catering, will you? Stay out of catering. I think the catering world is safe. Yeah. So. <laughs> like about a month from now, we'll read a press release like Walker Racing to take on catering for all North American sports <laughs> cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if I could do it, I'd we, love to try. We actually met, um, and, and this is why I knew this would be a good podcast. We met a year and a half ago at Long Beach. I was uh, I was part of a video crew for Jim Hancock. Um, we were doing a, a little video on a, on a driver that was trying to do some promotional stuff. And, you know, we'd never met and, and I'm just a camera guy with my business partner, Jason. And, and we walk in and we're not like one foot in the door and you yell at Jim, this is the best you could do. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, I like this guy. I like, Cause we're tired and we're haggard and it's just not a good look. And, it's like, and, and cause Jason and I are definitely guys who can appreciate this kind of, this kind of sense of humor. Yeah. So it's like, okay, we can hang. I like this <laughs> this guy. is going to be so, fine. Well, yeah. you know, the theory behind that. Uh, apart from taking, uh, putting some pressure on Jim, yeah. but the theory behind that is the best line of defense is attack. So if you're going to yeah. come in there and try to pull my, <laughs> pull me out and make me look bad, I'm going right. to go for you first, and then you're going to be always on the defensive. <laughs> It works. Good job. And obviously, I didn't do a good enough job because yeah, you now came we, we back. Yeah, we snuck back into your you office. You came back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Got a bloody microphone and a whatever. And, and when we walked in, you didn't even know what a podcast was, correct? Or you really had never been part of something like this? Uh, yeah, I have. I have. Okay. No, I, uh, the disconnect was I, um, I've i been thinking about a lot of other things, believe it or not. I mean, you guys Weird. should have been That's priority. Not, well, I thought we were. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I had forgot that I knew you guys were coming, and I forgot what the original reason was. So when I saw you, I thought, you know, what am I going to do with these guys again? <laughs> I mean, I saw your your email, as I said, and said right. something about audio yeah, I was like, I'm going to bring in some audio gear. And your reply was, no, I don't think the audio gear is I necessary. Said, I don't understand <laughs> what the hell you want <laughs> with audio. <laughs> <laughs> but once you told me, it all came into play. You know, you'll you, be, what, you'll so was the next two hours like, Shh. How do I get out of this? <laughs> yeah, that's we, that we was our assumption. Because like, we didn't hear from you. Like he's trying to get out of it. He's yeah, trying he's to get like, out of it. somebody give me something to do. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. I'm Bernie, not. you need something, anything. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, you know, I didn't. Uh, I didn't place. Uh, but it's yeah. I, when I said to you I would, it's just remembering that I had. And you know, when you get older, you should be so lucky. <laughs> If you only forget <laughs> that. I'm not. I, 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 I'm going to say you're about 48. Um, yeah, I easily. I don't, think I'm gonna, I don't think I'm going to make it. So you guys old. are about the same age then? Yeah, we're close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. close. Yeah. So um, if I recall correctly, you driver manage? You do driver I management? Did. Yeah, and you managed Simon for a long time, right? I did Simon and Will. Yeah. How did it come apart? Because I'm friends with Simon. I don't know Will at all, but Simon has actually been helpful to my career. Uh -huh. So I'm just curious to know how that came about. I know he drove the Atlantics program. Was he under your you know watch at that point or is that something that came from the Atlantic program no he didn't actually have a driver's uh, managers when he joined me um, he came over from France and he talked to um, Sebastian Baudet and said you know I need to go I want to go Atlantic who, who which team shall I go to and and uh, Sebastian uh, recommended us so Simon turned up here drove for us and uh, we won the championship. And uh, um, I, at the same time, was doing my Team Australia thing, which uh, was going on there. And um, because we won the championship, I was able to get some money, more money from the Team Australia side and use the money that he got from winning the championship, combine that, and then he raced in, in a Team Australia for me. Right. And then when we've finished Team Australia and he left and Will left, 
Um, it was sometime after that they were trying to get their rides sorted out and things, and they would come back to me and and ask me to you know what about this? Can I help right. me with that? And so we just sort of rolled into it that way. And I, it was my intention to go be a driver's manager, but those two I knew them well enough sure. that I could help them, and I did. I went on and managed them and got Will ultimately to Penske and ha I think uh, was behind the scenes trying to get Simon on board there as well and uh, ultimately it happened. Yeah, I mean those are two really great <laughs> prospects to have as your first driver yeah. management clients. I mean you could yeah. probably start a, just a side business alone doing that. Well, uh, they have a couple of things in common. Uh, one, they're both quick Yeah. and secondly, they're both tight as ducks asses. <laughs> as you Americans would like to say. They're both pretty tight. So I wouldn't say it was the most profitable venture being their manager. Copy that. That's funny. And they were they were pretty good friends for a while, and then they kind of had a rivalry build last year over some contact. Yeah, I, I think they've always had that rivalry. Yeah. Um, I think that's one thing about a driver that's really quick. When he races with other drivers, he soon knows who his real competition sure. is. And then it's 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 not that they hate him. It's just that they realize this is the guy that's got the capability to race me hard. Right. So there isn't a lot of pally, you know, oh, let, no, no, after you. Sure. You can win this weekend <laughs> and all that. Right. No, it's all about, you know, keeping everything close to your vest and, in one team, it's hard for them to do that, but uh, they're they're just fierce sure. competitors. Did you get any say in the Falcon Girls? I said hello. <laughs> Did they say it back? But I well, I had to say I had to look around first, make sure my <laughs> old lady wasn't watching me when I said hello. You know, I'm in charge of this place. <laughs> I am the boss. It's my name on the wall. I, I, yeah. did, I didn't have any choice in their selection, uh, but I appreciated them coming along and being so interested in our racing. Sure. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I don't know how much we should keep talking about yeah, Falcon, Falcon Tire. But, uh, <laughs> one of the, but one of the things I think about, you know, with the size and capacity of this shop, this has kind of been a recurring theme we've talked about um, with several of the personalities we've met. But um, I don't, it's, I don't think it's known how many time wasters exist in this sport um, in the sense of somebody call beyond us. Um, <laughs> he's like, really? He's like looking right at me. <laughs> he's like, do you well, know what the word irony uh, means? When, when you say after you, including me, or no, you no, just no. you so two? So like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but has has there anyone that's really taken you for a run that sort of, you know, you get that email or that phone call like, hey, I got this company and they're on the line for millions and millions and millions. So let's let's go get lunch. I want to come see the shop. And, you know, you go through three, four or five meetings, you take them to the track and it turned out they were full of ass, uh, full of crap the whole time. Uh, yeah, they get lots of them. Yeah. How common is that? Yeah. Oh, here? very common. Yeah. More so common in America. Yeah. So it's not as common in Europe. Uh, not my recollection from really? it, no. no. I wonder if that's... Huh. Um, no, uh, I, th I think um, people underestimate what it takes, yeah. and they underestimate the reasons why anybody would spend millions of dollars in racing. And uh, they always think, well, this company is, um, you know, a very wealthy company, and it would be a great fit for them to have their name on a race car. In reality, that's a kiss of death to yeah. actually think that way. Yeah. What, what you have to think of is, you know, a, a business reason why they'd want to do it. Yeah. And whether it's getting them business to business or whether it's uh, giving them uh, exposure that they wouldn't otherwise get in baseball yeah. or whatever or some special uh, reason for doing racing, you're wasting your time. Um, but it's, a, I would used to say to raise a million dollars and I'm not a salesman, so it took me longer than most. But I always always say to raise a million dollars in racing, regardless of what you're trying to sell it to, it takes you about a year. Yeah. And 99.9% .9 of everything you go after goes nowhere. Yeah. It's a huge uh, rate of no return. Right. So it's one of the most difficult things. But if you think about it, it's pretty obvious. You, for somebody to spend millions in racing, um, they've got to have a damn good reason to do that. And just saying uh, it's advertising is not enough. Yeah. Because when you say advertising, these companies say, oh, yeah, advertising. Okay, well, wait a minute. How many people watch your sport? Yeah. Right. 
If you don't have the eyeballs, you don't have the multiples, they're not going to do it. Well, especially in the year 2015, For it's, that it's so easy in the advertising world, I believe, in 2015 to say, okay, well, here's my budget, and now with things like Google AdWords and some targeted uh, internet yeah. campaigns, you can really go after the exact demographic you want, which you hit your spot. makes it a yeah. challenge. So. Yeah, so it's one of the more difficult parts of being involved in racing is yeah. obviously finding the money. The, the legend has it that Penske was one of the first, during your era, uh, was one of the first to really understand that sort of track side corporate culture you know you, you bring 50 guests to the track you give them the special jacket and they feel like they're part of the team and now it's it's worth something to them um, well he did but uh, on a very small uh, level i think the ones that really did it was neiman Haas. really yeah those were the ones that i thought they did it even better than that they would see an ability to go after companies that were involved with their um, sponsor that they were going after. So they'd show their sponsor a way to squeeze somebody who wanted their business to put the money into it to be on the car. So they'd try to find ways to um, use their leverage with all of their suppliers to pay into a marketing fund that they benefited more than anybody from. And, you know, Target was the copy yeah. of that. But it was Newman Haas that did that. Um, Penske was very much more, very corporate, but not um, on a mass scale did he bring along. He'd bring them along for the Just key the events, people, sure. but, you know, he wasn't necessarily, you know, squeezing them in that way right. at an event. Where he would get them was when it came to business, when right. it came to something that they were doing for them for in their other companies, then he, he would sell them on the idea that um, you know they can be involved with the racing and because they wanted to be involved in Penske it was an easier sell and the success was sort of almost guaranteed right right so it was a you know a pretty easy deal and they got business you know they got business out of it they Penske would sort of look at them as one of their partners look at around um, there's a, a recurring theme I see in a lot of your your posters and on your on your finger is is indie very specifically is is obviously it's indie so it's it's special to anybody who loves racing but it, it seems like that has a particular kind of bearing on on this office <laughs> Am I, wrong? Um, I don't know yeah yeah it was I mean uh, well I, I mean with the exception of a couple of them here which are Formula One uh, once I once I went to work for Penske in Formula One, and then he stopped after a year. Uh, rather than go jump back into the Formula One pool, I decided to stay with it because uh, he wanted to build his own Indy car. And I really did, I thought, well, that's the best way to go is to run the shop that was building the Indy cars and uh, focus on the manufacturing side rather than try to get back into racing. And so it was only because I would fly back and forward to America to look at to the Indy cars. Do you need to get that? Do you like my call? That sign? is amazing. That's the Muppet Show. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> is that Robin Miller calling? No. Okay. Oh. But is, your Muppet, is your Muppet Show just your ringtone? Yeah, channel? we definitely don't answer it if he... <laughs> <laughs> I think just knowing that the Muppet Show is your ringtone is yeah. everything we'll ever need to learn in well, this business. Well, I I shouldn't <laughs> take full credit for it. When I went to uh, when I worked uh, at IndyCar, I went there and um, I uh, affectionately called us Muppets at IndyCar. Right. We're Muppets this, Muppets that, and <laughs> you know it's one of those things when you get a word, you sort of right. always yeah, popping yeah. it out and. Right. And so my assistant, uh, Amanda Trotter, um, actually uh, got that off the internet and put it on my <laughs> on <your phone>. cell phone. <laughs> that, nothing makes me happy. If there's a highlight of this entire trip, it's, it's going to be known that Derek Walker's ringtone is The Muppet Show. Have you seen the new one? <laughs> no. It's really well done. Is it's, it? it's excellent. It's like, do you watch much TV? Only a little bit. Not a little much. Bit. News. Netflix? News. Of Mostly. course you watch the news. <laughs> nothing? You never Game of Thrones? Huh? Game of Thrones, better no, call Saul. Uh, I mean, I see it, but I haven't watched much of it. Fair enough. No. Fair enough. You gonna uh, would, uh, you gonna vote for Trump? Uh, actually, um, I probably don't uh, vote for him. I don't vote for anybody. Are you not allowed? I am actually. I'm an American citizen. Oh, good for you. Um, but you're a convict. I um, 
<laughs> I always look at the the politicians and say you can see individuals have got pieces that you think make sense, but when you look at the greater mass of politicians, I'm I'm less as a, enchanted by the whole thing. But I I do say unfortunately that I think everybody should vote, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> what about like, can we can we can we uh, can we announce right here that you're going to run for something? How about state senator? No, I no? probably not. Oh. No, they're not looking for one anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I I I don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Sure. Probably uh, first time in many years I'm sitting here and wondering. Is that exciting? Um, I, I wouldn't say it's not exciting. I mean, exciting is when you know what you're doing. Yeah, sure. When sure. you're sort of trying to figure out what you've uh, going, you know, what should you do? It's um, you know, it's a work in progress, so yeah. you don't know what to think. I've always, I've always been fortunate enough to, um, you know, whether it's a five or a ten year cycle or whatever is sort of do a job for a while and then opens up. There's another something, and I go off yeah. and do that. So. I haven't exactly stayed in one job specific, right. um, um, probably team owner mostly. But sure. so I've I've benefited from moving around. So moving somewhere else is not um, uh, is not something I wouldn't entertain, sure. if, as long as it's something I can do. And racing is about all I know. Right. So if uh, if John Q Moneybags comes in with a bowler hat, a satchel of money, and says, Derek, whatever you want to do, let's go do it. What would that be? Uh, well, first of all, I have to clear you Muppets out of the room. So if somebody's going to we're here all week. Yeah. So if some, somebody's going to talk turkey, I've got to get you lot out. Cause yeah. You brought your turkey because that bacon and whatever it was. Blame on me, and I'm not taking it. That sandwich didn't cut it. Uh, what would it be? Um, it depends on what he wants and how much money. I don't. I, I love racing, so I don't really care which one. If I if I had all the money. As I said when I was at IndyCar, I'd like to come back as a team owner next year and be bitching about air kits and race control. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole time. I yeah, want yeah. my turn yeah. where I can <laughs> bitch about them because that's all I've heard about what I was doing when I was there. Uh, but no, I, I, as long as you've got uh, you know, a racing that's challenging, I don't care what it is, really. As long we, as it can be a business venture. We have a recurring theme on the show where it's a pass along question. And so we recently sat down with John DeGuise of Sports Car 365, and it kind of hits on what you were just getting at. So I'll just ask John's question um, and see if we get another answer out of you. But basically, as a team owner, director of competition, many different facets of motorsports, is there anything you want to try that you haven't done yet? Uh, yeah. Oh, you want to know? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm fine with yeah. <laughs> Moving along. <laughs> no, I. Uh, I'm going to give you an odd answer. Um, I'd like to be successful. I've done a lot of things. <laughs> so I'm it's looking around pretty, the room. Pretty good to me. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's some. Uh, they're successful to some extent, but not totally. Sure. It's unfulfilled business. Okay. I mean, yeah, I've been involved in IndyCar racing, but how many win? How many wins? How many championships? No, win, no championships. I was involved in Formula One. Yeah, we won some races. Was involved in a championship. Did I have my own Formula One team? And could uh, you know say as a, a ma uh, you know a profitable venture? Not always. So uh, you know, as long as there's an opportunity out there, whatever I do, I, I'd rather. I'd like to. You know, be successful at it, and that may sound pretty corny, but that's <laughs> probably about it. Yeah. Well, on that same theme, our next uh, dinner with racers is going to be with Brian Clausen. Are you familiar with him? Sure. Okay, so Brian's raced for people that might not be. He's raced everything from uh, USAC midgets all the way up to yeah. the Indy 500, 500 and yeah. nationwide cars and all sorts of really cool stuff. So, um, one question that you can think of for Brian Clausen. Um. Have you got a five-year plan? That's a good question. That's a great question. Because yeah. um, in this business, regardless of whether you're Brian or you're a chief mechanic or a team owner, a wannabe IndyCar official, um, <laughs> I think you've always got to be thinking about the future and to have a plan. Because if I think if you can, it sounds corny again, but if you can visualize three to five years from now, 
and and this is my advice to you two Muppets here, by the way, too, is <laughs> if you can think, uh, you know, five years down the road, well, imagine where you could see yourself if you could really do this job right. Um, what, uh, but seriously, what you would want to be, because I think when you, because I'm older, you know, I can look back on it, I, I'd say um, more luck than judgment, but being fortunate enough to get uh, an opportunity to be in a business you like doing and, and to have had a lot of opportunity uh, was more luck than judgment. But I think if I had to do it again, I would want to be a little bit more deliberate by thinking a little bit more about the future and planning. Because uh, when you visualize where you want to be, uh, I think you start programming yourself to work towards that. But if yeah. you just take life as it comes, then sometimes you end up with no sponsorship like me. Yeah. So that isn't good. You've got to be, you gotta be as a plan because nobody's going to bring it to you and give it to you. You've got to go out and get it, usually. On the... On a similar sort of topic, Brian Clawson being a young driver, but he's already made a name for himself and his path is probably set. Do you have any advice for the driver that's just coming out of Skip Arbor or maybe just coming out of go-karts? What are the things I'm sure you've been handed a million proposals from kids that want you to hire them for many different programs? What are the things that you look for in a young guy that's coming up or a girl? And, or, and then what are some of the things that you've had to deal with and you're like, ugh, obviously Little League Dads is, a, is annoying. Yeah, but, you know, sometimes that's the only way they can get there, so you you got to take them as they find them. Sure. Um, well, there's, there's obviously a lot to learn when you're um, a young driver starting out, and, and it's, it's try to develop as many people as you can get um, attached to or can get to know who you really admire and try to suck them dry of everything they know. You don't literally have to do everything, but getting their, the benefit of hearing their experience is beneficial to you because somewhere in what you hear from these people, a, a wide range of people, somewhere in these people's advice, you will find some lessons that will be the right fit for you. And I think uh, I would be looking up for anybody that's been that, been ahead of me. How do you, how do you, or better yet, look at somebody not better yet, but the other thing is look at somebody who you admire and say, you know, when I get to where I want to be, I want to be like him. And then try to understand what does he do that's different? Right. How do I have to be that kind of guy right. to get there? Because these are role models and they've all done what you're about to do before. So it's nothing new. So benefiting from them or using them as a role model is important, I think, because uh, you don't get too many shots at it. And, you know, when you're a young guy and you get, you're going to go see a team owner, you're going to try and tell him, you're Mr. Wonderful, first impressions are... It's a big deal. They're a big deal. Yeah. So make sure you've got a plan going in and it, you're not overly prepared, but you've got to tell something and invariably it's it's the real person they want to get they don't want to have somebody who's been you know yeah, programmed right, right. they want to hear the real the real deal and uh, most of them anyway and ultimately they've got to be able to back it up with some speed of course but capability and now having been here through this lunch i've realized that i've probably seen the best of you two right oh that's it this is that's not it better. it's yeah, not yeah, yeah, it's yeah. all downhill from this there, point on got it's a, the off season leave me alone yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a one hour plan <laughs> and, uh, yeah the sport <laughs> um, uh how long have you been with the missus actually uh 47 years jesus um <laughs> how's that work um, it works very well. Um, you know, I like to say that I've got so much money invested <laughs> in her <laughs> that it's, <laughs> it's impossible to think about changing her out at this point. <laughs> you might as well stick it out. So I might as well yeah, stick it out yeah. to at least 100 anyway, and then I'll <laughs> think about a young chick or something. Uh, no, it works very well. My wife... Um, Is she a race fan? Uh, sort of, but not much. You yeah. know, she, she, she knows what it's all about. But I think you know, I've been fortunate enough as somebody who understood <clears throat> that uh, racing is is consuming. Right. And um, we, meaning 
people that are in racing are really the happiest when we're doing what we like to do. Right. Right. It again sounds corny, but um, she's been uh, understanding enough to to let me go and do the job. Nice. Did so. you know that Spencer from Pelly killed somebody? Sorry. So we've we've heard about fathers. Um, who is the uh, who is it in the paddock that's that's the guy you can go have a beer with and and laugh out loud with? Uh, well, there's lots. Sure. Um, I mean, it, it's all about relationships, racing, and um, and it's all about people, right? It's not about race cars. It's about people. Sure. So uh, along the way, over the years, you you meet a lot of people, and a lot of them you do laugh with. Uh, uh, there's several in different teams that I sort of come across that you know you're always pulling each other's leg and laughing and having a beer. Do you want actual names sure, of those yes. people? If you only if you're given. <laughs> well, there's a guy. Um, there's a guy at uh, Sam Schmidt's. His name is. Uh, uh, no, I won't tell you his name. <laughs> you'll get him into he trouble. He did that on purpose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah didn't you hear he got run over in the paddock a few years ago? <laughs> No. Okay. No, he's he's on to us. <laughs> His well, name's uh, well, Greg Beck. Okay. And he does the transmissions. Nice. Funny guy. Good guy. He's sort of the class clown. Of but, well, he's not so much a clown. He's just got his New Zealander and he has a, yeah. a good, funny sense. Every time we see each other, we're all sort of pulling each other. But, I mean, there's lots of them out there. Sure. And, you know, uh, none of them... Uh, would be necessarily uh, happy if I went expose them because then sure. their team owners would say, "Well, it looks like you're a laughing stock." You know, <laughs> sure, well, especially you're not doing huge, the job quick enough. And with the huge, huge audience draw, tens of yeah, of yeah, yeah. People. But you know, people um, relationships, which um, and racing being what it is, uh, I, uh, talking about that though, I will, I will make a comment on that is. If you ask me back when I started and what uh, it's like nowadays, um, the the atmosphere and the um, camaraderie, if you like, um, it's changed obviously over time. Back then, as we all say, back in the old days, they were always better than they are now. Of course, and they were in some respects. Um, back in those days. Um, the biggest thing was practical jokes. I mean, you would get some real corkers that would come <laughs> up that people would do, and they people would laugh their head off. And uh, and there was, you know, there was the rivalry between teams, but there there was always this sort of humour part. And work back then to work all night was was a given. I mean, you you had so few people. The Brabham team, for example, if we had. If we had the total team, it was maybe ten or twelve people, total team, and and uh, most of them drove the trucks or and or went to the races and built the cars and repaired the cars and and um, you know you, working all nighters would take uh, the sting off every, anybody's humor, but there was a lot of humor back then. There was a lot of um, practical jokes as I say nowadays it's it's much more business like and it's uh, it's sort of the the corporate mold you know the corporate look and everything the way it is which I think you know is a good thing um, but um, with it I think is it's gone a lot of a lot of humor I think than what we used to see back then Sean knows a thing or two about parody none what do you mean Sean's kind of the uh, known media guy in sports car racing for funny videos and, ah, and things like yeah. that. So that's kind of how we were able to get this together. Yeah, that's actually how this got funded somehow. Yeah. <laughs> you mean you're getting paid? No, that's a stretch. We have a travel budget at least. We've, this has been a road trip for us. We I, started in Atlanta. and We started the day after Petite, yeah. basically. Yeah. 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 We drove all the way to San Francisco and back. Yeah. And, and we're, we're still, still have talking. four more days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we go well, from... you know, if you, I'm not saying this because you're sitting here, but um, I wouldn't do that because then you'd give you a false sense of importance. But no. <laughs> that's we're not <laughs> worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> Far be it from me to do that. Um, but uh, I always think in racing, um, there's so many stories behind the stories yeah. 
uh, that never get told. Right. And th that's what I find one of the most interesting parts about the racing. You know, you see a result and you never really know how it ever got sure. there or yeah. what actually happened, you right. know. And uh, sometimes you always think, well, you know, that um, those experiences and those events um, come and go and they're lost. Yeah. You know, nobody nobody ever want or thinks about asking, right. well, gee, what happened then? Right. Or everybody is sort of got a gag order on it for, you for know, whatever statute reason. of yeah. limitations run out or something. <laughs> right. I know nothing about that either. <laughs> so uh, it's, but it's, it's a shame. There's, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of racing that, never gets told well i would say also one of the interesting things is you know in the modern era of, of social media fans now have access to what a, a driver or a team owner thinks before it's ever been out there and and from what we've looked into you're you're not terribly active on social media correct like there's not a Derek walker i try twitter. i try not to be can we make a Derek walker walker twitter <laughs> can we please just let us just, we'll just He's run like, it for yeah, you. i'm sure you could <laughs> what would i do that for <laughs> How much are you going to pay me? Oh, oh there you go. Oh, there it goes. Uh, okay, guy. yeah. He gets, he gets it. it. He gets, he gets it. it. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I don't really feel like I've got much to Twitter about. Oh, but uh, we do. And the irre irrelevance of that sort of format to me is fine if you're at certain generation doing a certain thing. But for me, at my stage in my game, I'm yeah. not sure twitting around is really... <laughs> <laughs> you You have, like, real things to do. Yeah. Well... Yeah. Uh, also, my the definition of twit <laughs> for me is something different than it is for you millenniums. <laughs> well, nearly. <laughs> maybe not. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm, a twit uh, where I come from is not complimentary. Comes, yeah. No, I understand. You change one letter, it becomes a whole other thing too. But, so. uh, but no, I think um, you know it's good for those who want it, but it's sure. not. Not something I've participated in for I'll obvious reasons. We could change your world right now, setting it up. <laughs> <laughs> we could do it. Uh, I actually have a Twitter. Oh, do you really? Yeah, but yeah. I've never. I couldn't tell you how to use it. Or better. did you, I, did somebody set it up for you? Yeah. Who did it? Uh, Elizabeth Power or Elizabeth Cannon is I her don't name. Know her. Uh, Will Power's wife. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, she good. she worked here. Yeah. In fact, when Will came, she worked here. And is that how they met? Yeah, that's how they met. Right. Do you get a cut? No, I didn't. No percentage on that? Well, they were very fortunate that I didn't fire the two of them because we have house rules of that course. you're not allowed yeah, to yeah. you know, mix yeah. with the talent. And uh, those two were an entity. We're and talking I was about Liz in, as the talent, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, clearly. Definitely yeah. Will. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be that. <laughs> and uh, I think I was the last person on the team. It became a bit of a joke. I was the last person on the team to find out that they were an entity going out together. But, you know, it is what it is. Well, but they're uh, still around, right so it right worked out end, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, Liz, I, I was, Liz was telling me about a certain person's Twitter. You ought to see what he's writing on right now. I said, well, I can't see it. I don't go on that thing. Well, I'll set you up. You can go look at it. So she set it up, and and I've never... I've That's never, it. I've never tried to even figure out. Yeah. But they keep sending me. You might be interested in this, and I keep getting all these things. I keep <laughs> friends. You should meet. I keep yeah, yeah. zapping them, and I keep coming back. I'm actually looking me. at the Derek Walker Twitter page here, and do you know what the last thing he tweeted was? No, it wasn't me. I believe it was. It's a picture of this helmet. And it says, I have Robbie Gordon's 94 Indy 500 helmet. If he doesn't come back, I'll use it for the 500. Oh, Elizabeth uh, did that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Nice. Yeah. I've never touched it. Uh. And then the <laughs> next, the, the the post before that is a picture of Starbucks out looking at an ocean on the beach. Yes. Yeah, when I go down to Florida, that's all I do is uh, look at the you, beach. Do you go down there on vacation or just? Uh, no, I have a I have a condo oh, down there. Where, where about? Uh, it's like halfway between Fort Myers and Naples. Okay. Right yeah. down there. I mean, I, I don't go down there much, but my, I do. And so I I think I sent that to her, and she put it on uh, Twitter for some reason. I can't remember. What now. year was that? Uh, it was last year, 14. Oh, okay. Your very first tweet, any idea? Any clue? Not a clue. It's a quote, and it says, never put off tomorrow what you can do today. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that That's a, one of mine. Is that a regular one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or I used to have a sign on the back of my door there which said, change or be changed. <laughs> which uh, t to me summarizes what this business is all about. You've got to keep 
you got to keep reinventing, you know, improving. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you get left behind, right. which was really a reminder to me that I'm getting old and eventually I'll not <laughs> be able to do this. <laughs> and i got to find some way to keep in here. <laughs> so what to kind of wrap this up, what do you think the next – where's the next place we're going to see a Walker Racing entry? Or do you think you're going to continue – looking for opportunities in the management side of series or well I, i'd like to think i could do both um, because i have at the moment competent people after all i went away for two and a half years to run competitions and operations in indycar and we still continued on and we won a race and uh, so so i have good people so i'd like to stay in gt racing with those that group of people because it works um like to look at um, doing something in the management side of you know series or something like that I, I enjoyed working at IndyCar uh, the challenge and uh, you know the one thing about that kind of job is you do have it sounds very noble in a way to say this but you, you do have a, a feeling that you're in a position to make something different you got a chance to you can't make dramatic change because you know change costs money and you gotta right. go understand fully before you make a change but you do have a feeling that you're in a unique position that um, uh, gives you an opportunity to, to maybe make a difference but it, it takes takes years you know I wasn't there long enough right I was still trying to figure out where the restroom was over there <laughs> <laughs> it's in the parking lot. <laughs> Which some people say, well, good job he didn't find it. It might still be here. So, <laughs> Well, if, if if the funding comes through for – we expect this to be such a huge success for us that there will be a season two and we'll be making tons of money. Um, so here here would be my suggestion. Dinner with Racers podcast season two with Ryan Eversley, Sean Heckman, and Derek Walker. And you, and you go on the road trip with us. You can drive the bus. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we don't that have a bus. We, can do we don't have a bus yet. We that's will. The plan. We expect. Uh, yeah. we're, we're gonna get round to talking terms soon, right? Ah, uh, sure. <laughs> the sandwich, <laughs> sandwich wasn't enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't we do anything for money around here. Food, the food, the food's free. Yeah. 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 yeah well, uh, I'd try another approach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still carrying this bacon and lettuce tomato sandwich around with me. <laughs> it, it hasn't actually digested. It's still down there. <laughs> Talk to the guys down the street. I'm t- Armin, yeah. that's his. Armin, yeah, he, <laughs> was, Deli. he was the guy. No, it's all right. We'll we'll let him off the hook. <laughs> I got nothing. Yeah, cool. I think we're good. So, anything else you want to throw out? Well, what are you two gonna do with the rest of your life? I'm Have gonna you got a plan. <sighs> I'm not aging well, so yeah, I don't Sean, think I'm gonna last Sean's much five year plan is don't die. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's much. not looking we, good. We uh, are are. We throw a, like a company Christmas party every year. We do a big go kart thing, and we we give out T-shirts to all of our customers. And our like in our third or fourth year of business, we um, our T-shirt said our four hundred one k is death, <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty much that's the plan we're on right now. So. Sure. Yeah, membership card <laughs> for death. Five year plan. That's a good like when I was listening to you describe why it's important. I mean, I obviously am constantly thinking about my future because I know I have a limited shelf life and that's kind of why i wanted to do things like this like the podcast and i do social media for continental tire in fact when i get done with this on sunday on monday i fly to sema and i spend the week this is the third year in a row covering sema for continental on all their website and facebook and twitter and all that stuff and i'm trying to build a media you know background so that when racing does end i can either hopefully go into commentary or production for events yep. or something along those lines because i know at any moment it can come to a screeching halt but as long as i can you know interact with people i think that'll help me have some sort of income yeah so oh well anything's possible if i <laughs> if i take my own situation for example right. um i mean i didn't start life as a team owner so obviously along the way uh, um it led me here but um I think, and honestly, say I always sort of had something I wanted to do, and it it eventually sort of happened. I don't know if it was luck or judgment, but it did. Um, and it and I, it used to be a five-year plan, but nowadays it's actually a three years. It's a it's a cycle. Things change so much. I'm not sure you could predict uh, five accurately years. five right. years. Right. Whereas back in when I started, five years was a very realistic number. But a three year is an easier one to visualize and uh, accomplish because if you look at what could happen in the next three years, 
um, and really think to ask yourself, this is part of the psycho uh, uh, driver management program, which I'm going to have to charge you for now because <laughs> I'm giving you all my secrets. Uh, yeah, invoice Sean. Yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you if you have an objective, then it, uh, it uh, behooves the question is how you're going to get there. Right. How do you see that coming together? Yeah. And what do you need to do to make that come together? Uh, what do you personally have to do, um, not only to have, but to do to make it happen? So that that's sort of nothing trick about that, but if you're really thinking that way and, and really focusing on that, accomplishing that, you'll be surprised what actually comes out of it. Right. Um, but three years is not that out of reach that um, it should be something everybody should do, whether you're it's absolutely right. doing racing or not. And th th the other thing, being older, we get really heavy now. <laughs> <laughs> I assume you're going to edit most of this out, but as you get older, um, it sounds, again, very obvious, but you realize that um, the best years of your life are all about preparing yourself for the worst years of your life when you get older and you can't do it. And so you better A, have done it early enough so you can, and you better have stashed away. Those little squirrels are running and putting things in hiding places, and they're not that dumb. They put it away for a rainy day or right. snow or right. whatever. Well, we as humans in our, our years from, I don't know, I'm going to say it's earlier than that nowadays, but I would say from your 20s, to your 50s are really the years that you should be stashing it away or positioning yourself so when you do start coasting a bit because you can't keep that pace up right. all the time that you've got uh, you've got yourself ready for that and you're not still having to keep that speed up and sure. burn yourself out sooner than you obviously i never did any of this <laughs> that's why i know that i screwed up <laughs> I, well, I you could sell off some of the stuff in here. You'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's not worth very much. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie Gordon's helmet sitting right there. Yeah. Well, Robbie, Robbie's never going to hear this, but he'd be like, hey. <laughs> oh, yeah, you gave it to me, right? Uh, I got a Rick Mears and a Danny Sullivan. Oh, you're good. Yeah, that's awesome. He'll that ought to get me some money. Yeah. That Dan Clark hat. Yeah, that was that was the only thing Dan gave me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if if I didn't know him, if I didn't know Dan was English, I would have said he was Scottish. <laughs> he's, a, he's a tight little mother. Uh, I like. We that. should just do like a one word, you know. Just yeah, one word on each of these first guys. Thing, first thing you think when I say this name, willpower, speed, Simon Pagano. Um, talented. Robbie Gordon. Impetuous. Wow. I like that. Yeah. Sarah Fisher. That's a tough one. Um, a racer. He was a racer. Danny Sullivan. Hollywood. <laughs> That's excellent. Roger Penske. Success. Al Hunter Jr. Al Hunter Jr. Unfortunate. Wolf Hensley. Also a racer. I was, I was hoping you'd say German. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a racer. But uh, Graham I love Hill. him. About Graham Hill. Uh, funny. Yeah, believe that. It's very comical, yeah. and he could drive as well. Funnier than us. In a in a <laughs> much more mature way. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's pretty good. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. No, yeah. he was funny guy. Yeah. What about uh Tagliani? Uh, nervous energy. Yeah, I, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's spot on. Shinji Nakano. <laughs> You're determined to bury this I little know, sucker, aren't you? No, no, not at all. 
<laughs> um, I just find it fun. Nice guy. All right. I like Sinji. We don't want to keep you too long, but that is, I, f- I remember that win, the Portland one with Gilles DeFerrin. And that was one of my favorite races of all time. Yeah. Where he got on the slicks right at the, you know, at the very end. Was that your call? Was that his call? My call. It was your call. Well, actually, it was, it was uh, again, that's one of those stories behind the story. Yeah. Is Cause where, this, is, this is Portland, I think, 97. The last year of Goodyear. No. That's the last win. That's right. Good it was. Tires. Yeah, because it's Portland. It was raining, and then it went dry. And it was one of those things where, you know, it was kind of the track was kind of dry, but no one was on slicks just yet. And do you want to know the real story, or yes. you want to put your version? No, I would like to know the real story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shut up, Sean. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> Actually, it had nothing to do with the rain. Huh. Um, we started up front, and we were running fairly quick, and the Goodyear tires would drop off. And so we were fourth or fifth, and the Firestones were taken off. And um, uh, tires were were losing so much. And I asked uh, engineer or whatever at the time, Bill Pappas, I think it was, is uh, when do we stop? And so it was a long way off. And I could see us just going back and back. And so I said, well, what's... What's the point of us staying out? Why don't we stop early and take on new tires and get ourselves out of sequence? So we did that. We got out, and so we got new tires, and we were out of sequence for everybody else. And then when everybody else was coming to their pit stop cycle, we were You're we were through on, cycle through, yeah. We were on our thing, so we pulled out a gap, and then ultimately it all came our way, and we we benefited from it because nice. we. Because if I'd stayed on it, we weren't getting the mileage to go as far as they could. We yeah. were losing miles, and our tire life was so so bad that we we're losing speed. So, to get the mileage, we'd have to go even slower, and we would end up never catching them. So yeah. the only way to do is to go out of sequence. We didn't know they would all work out that way, but that's how it did. Nice. So it was Tenth. more. Uh, I can tell you another one in. Teo Fabi at Mid Ohio. The Porsche. The Porsche. We won that. And that again was the story behind the story, which was comes in for a pit stop, um, plugs in, uh, there was a screw up and the fuel had pulled out too soon and off he goes and he's lapping like really good because he hasn't got enough fuel yeah. in. Nobody else knows we haven't got enough fuel. So the question was, do we come back in and stab it and suffer with it later on, or we just try and pull out a lead? And so, because everybody else is working on their strategy right. to save the fuel, right. they're, they're capped at their speed. Mm-hmm. And we're going like, you know, Italian dogs down the road with tail <laughs> driving, which he could drive really well when he got in the zone and he had the right. So car's lighter and we're not going to screw about uh, fuel mileage because all we want to do is get the next pit stop and get back out in the lead. And that's what happened. They they thought we had some marvelous strategy, but it really wasn't. It was the fact that the thing went out and it wasn't full. <laughs> So the car was lighter. <laughs> Instead of dialing it down to get the mileage to get to the next pit stop, when right. so of the fewest pit stops, or the, the least amount of pit stops we needed, we did the reverse because we had no alternative. And everybody thought it was... And then the driver, uh, Teo, when he came out of the car, he was a bit bumpy. And when he found out we had screwed up in the pit stop, he was really pissed. Even after he won. <laughs> Even though he's because taken, yeah. it was taken away for his, from his ability right. yeah, to be right. the guy who drove so well, so fast, sure. and whipped everybody, that it was now... But we never, ever told anybody, oh, it wasn't Teo. It was our screw-up in the pits that won the race. We just <laughs> That's not a common phrase. Yeah. It was our screw-up in the pits yeah. that won. Yeah, yeah, we just quietly <laughs> let it go. And uh, But Teo was pissed about that. Not a happy camper. <laughs> well, I give you credit for uh, not really knowing us and, and giving us quite a bit of time, actually. So uh, thank you for that, despite not knowing what the hell we were about to do. Yeah, well, I'm I'm gratified in knowing that you're going to reduce this down to about a minute. And sure. And these <laughs> last three, five, whatever number of hours we've been sitting here are just going to be a complete, utterly waste of time. <laughs> That's what we're good at. 
So, uh, all right. I think on that note, Continental's got the check. All right. Hey, you should tell those things they need to get on an RSR portion. Let's go racing. It's Continental. Come oh. on. <laughs> <laughs> you just told him. All yeah. right. That's pitch. <laughs> How awesome is Derek Walker? My buddy Marshall Pruitt gave him the best title. We've all heard the expression, master of puppets. Marshall refers to uh, Derek as the pastor of Muppets, which I think is very apropos. So, all right, uh, nothing more to be said. I will close this one out with another song from Citizen Cope. Here's a song called Healing Hands, also available on iTunes. Enjoy. I will never forget your healing hands, my love. Though my heart has stopped, it's what I've given up. Oh, I will never forget your healing hands, my love. You gave me daylight, you gave me sunlight. Turn the tape recorder on We just left Jackie old for Marilyn Monroe And we all bought and sold A full back old firearms and alcohol And what's a pocket full of gold Without a woman that you could hold Got a for to be a back burn on no more Now we got a lot of places to go Cause the actions of a few have put a world in harm's way And history has proven the day killed our leaders dead I don't know about a right and wrong I got a muse from the east to the west All I know is if I never said it before I'm gonna say it with my last breath I will never forget Your hands before you come to the mill Cut out light goes a 